read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey welcome back it's another great day here. Read me romance. I feel like a game show host sometimes. <laughs> I feel like I always say the same thing too, but I'm like, yeah. I don't know what else to say. Yep. We've got uh, the second installment of Girls Not Out by Ember Davis. Um, we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But before then, um, I've got some lady listener emails, but there's something I wanted to mention too. Um, on TikTok, I've been making videos Wow. Where um, I'm getting so many messages about your video. That's great, though. I love that. Um, Anytime so, somebody emails me, they mention your TikTok. <laughs> do they really? That's yeah. great. That's good. I hope it continues to go that way. Um, so I do an interview every day with the heroine of a book. So I just pick one of our random books. I'll grab one. If I can think of something, like I'll look at a cover and if I can think of something right away, I'll do that one. Mm -hmm. If it's one I have to think on, like everybody wants me to do Guarding His Obsession. I have tried and tried to think of something like that. And the only thing I can come up with is me sitting there going, you're a dummy. <laughs> like, that's all Why I do you hate her so much? I, I, I don't her. hate her. I don't hate her. I don't <laughs> hate her. I love her, but she's a dummy. <laughs> you know what you should do one day when you're like between books? Mm -hmm. You should listen to the audio. No, gosh. I couldn't. I, couldn't. I can't listen to any of our audios on the books I love. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't dislike, I love this book. I love Guarding His Obsession. She's I love just both so of dizzy. them. I love him and her. Yeah. I love the best friend that gets pregnant a million times. Yep. <laughs> it's great. I don't know. It's always, that one has always stuck with me through all of mm -hmm. our stuff. It's a good one. So I make, it'll be out by the time I say this. I'm making one tomorrow for flight risk. Oh my God. Because I saw the cover and I was like, oh, I got something for this. And I started flipping through the pages, which was a mistake because I was like, holy fuck, this book is dirty. Jesus is dirty. Did like, I get it on like in the back room? Um, so, okay. So she's, uh, she's in line and they, he sees her on a video. He's just walking, because this guy like owns the airport or something. He's just walking through and he sees her on one of the security videos and he stops and he's like, I want her. And so the security guard she's talking to that's checking her ID, he has like an earpiece and he's like, you got to come with me. Mm -hmm. And he takes her in the back and then this guy shows up and he's basically like, you can come to Paris with me or you can stay here. Those are your choices. Because she was supposed to go to Paris. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I guess I'm going with you. <laughs> so she goes on this private plane. Two seconds later, they're like fucking. I mean, well, they're not even fucking. He's like fingering her while she's buckled into the seat. But then like she falls asleep on him and he's like putting his dick in her face <laughs> asleep. And, like, it is that sounds so... like something you did. Oh, oh, it's definitely my chapter. Because <laughs> I'm reading and I'm like, oh, this is not okay. I love it. <laughs> it's so bad hold on oh, oh my god i'm gonna pull it up because i'm gonna quote this in the video this i don't even know if i can say it <laughs> like flushing. i know it says i bet she tastes like a goddamn candy store from her mouth to her asshole <laughs> i remember that <laughs> it's so bad and the other one says that she's going to ride my cock on the top of the goddamn Eiffel Tower while wearing a beret and eating a motherfucking croissant if I have anything to say about it. That sounds wonderful. This book is like, how? How did we write this? Your TikToks kill me because, I don't know, when we're writing our books, I don't think about how beyond ridiculous they are. I just love them. I'm like, no. ah! Yeah, though, you, this is fun. When you say it in your TikToks, mm -hmm. I like my I blush. Yep. I'm like, oh my God, did we really say that? Did we yes. really write that? Oh my yes. God. Did terrible. we really write that a heroine gets kidnapped twice in one <laughs> book by two different people? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> the one I did today was the book Not Yet, and that one is so dirty. Oh I love God. that book, actually. That book is so good because there's like one point where they don't want their parents to hear and they're mm -hmm. in her bed and he has to put his hand over her mouth it's so bad i oh love the God. cover too because she's like peeking over his mm -hmm. shoulder like, she's like behind he's got like nipple. a nice chest and mm -hmm. he's like barely peeking over 
Mm-hmm. Like he's trying to hide her. Yeah, it's a good one. But um, yeah, flight risk. If you just want something just fucking nasty, go get that one because it's really good. Oh my god! But the reason we wrote that book was when we were in Germany in oh, line, and there was a security oh. guard there, and we were like, Oh Whoa. my god, the <laughs> customs guy. He was like, Yes. Full ripped out, mm-hmm. tatted up, and he's he like, big. Passport. He was, and I'm like, whoa, big. Rob, stand, move back, <laughs> move back a little bit. I just remember like doing something with my luggage, and like you hit my arm or something like that, and I was like turning around. I was like, what? Oh fuck! <laughs> I was, like, usually he not came one out. To call yes. out something like that. It's Same. not me. I didn't even notice the guy's dick hanging out in the spa that one time. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah, that was one where I was like, I will stop and appreciate this. I I have drugs. (laughs) (laughs) They're in my vagina. (laughs) No, 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 no. I want you, not the lady. I want the big guy, him. (laughs) Can you imagine I have drugs? The one with thick fingers, him. Uh huh. Oh the boom, the big old hands. They could like palm a basketball. Ooh, Lord. Okay, let's read some lady listener emails. This is entitled Sex Sent Me to the ER. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but I'm so excited. Hello again, ladies. I love you guys. I'm so sorry if this is long, but it all comes together in the end. Sex talk. My daughter and I had to have the sex talk. My mother overheard and was shocked. I told my daughter, if he does not give you an orgasm first, don't let him stick his dick in you. (laughs) That's great advice. After the shock wore off, my mom agreed that maybe that may have been the the best way to stop her from having sex for years. (laughs) She said great advice. "Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to start using that. Romance is real. I'm so tired of people trying to devalue romance. I am lucky to be living in a real life romance. My husband of 20 years brings me coffee and bacon in the shower. His face lights up every time he sees me. He does little things to make me feel appreciated daily. Every day he takes my breath away, which brings me to my trip to the emergency room. I recently had a partial mastectomy. Yep, I only have one boob. My husband still looks at me like I am the prettiest girl in the room. He liked me bald and would joke about how my bald head feels on his balls. (laughs) She put the eye roll emoji. (laughs) I made a joke that I wanted him to be be all alpha and tell me what to do. So he ordered me to lay down and let him eat me till I passed out. It was the middle of the day. The kids were running around and my mother was visiting. So I locked the door and promised to be quiet. He was not joking. I held my hands over my mouth to keep quiet. I felt a small pop in a small pop in my ear. When he was done, I gave him a high five and laughed because the room was spinning. Oh, Hours wow. later, the room was still spinning. My husband told me to stay in bed and play video games. The next day, I still could not walk without holding on to walls. I went to the hospital. Because of COVID, my husband dropped me off. I was vague about how my ear popped. They ran tests and gave me medicine to help. While I was waiting, I called my husband. He was bragging about his skills. I told him it was all his fault. I was there. I was here and he needed to earn my forgiveness. A nurse overheard us and had a social worker talk with me thinking I was being abused. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> I told the social worker that I was dizzy because of sex. She gave me a really puzzled look and asked, how? I said, oral sex. And she leaned and asked, how <laughs> looking even more confused just uh, she said wow and started fanning herself i could hear her i could hear the patient and the nurse on the other side of the curtain giggling after that the doctors and nurses all checked on me all checked in with me after several hours and some medicine the vertigo and for the vertigo they sent me home my husband picked me up and got a standing ovation from the ER staff. It took me a week before I was able to stand up without that medicine. <laughs> now he likes uh, now now he likes to lock the door and say, "I'm going to make you pass out this time. Don't send help." LOL. I won't say. She's name never gonna let that down. He's gonna talk about no, that forever. On his, on his deathbed, he's like, "Remember that time I ate your mom's pussy <laughs> until she popped her eardrum." <laughs> Oh my That's God. incredible. 
That's funny. She, I love that the 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 lady like thought she was being abused, and then she's like, "No, no, tell me how this. I need to de- tell me exactly what he did to do that." <laughs> All right, this one's entitled "A New Spark." You asked for emails relating stories of how a relationship has come back to life after spicing things up in the bedroom. A few years ago, I became an avid romance reader thanks to the popularity of Fifty Shades of Grey. Reading romance, along with becoming more self-confident with weight loss, made my imagination and sexual exploration blossom. My husband of nearly 16 years and I have now renewed our sexual lives and engaged in lovemaking about four times as often as we did prior. Nothing too wild, but we definitely are more intimate and willing to explore our naughty sides a little bit more. It really has strengthened our whole relationship. By the way, I love the podcast. It's my guilty pleasure. Keep up the great work. Lady listener in Fargo, North Dakota. You know what I was thinking about? This made me think of it. Was I always like to have something playing. Like, you listen to audiobooks. I'll listen to reruns of old shows. Mm -hmm. And I started watching The Housewives of, like, um, Beverly Hills from the start the other couple weeks ago when I'm just doing errands or whatever. And I had it playing in the background. And I I wished, because you get to see their lives from, like, 10 years ago and how prudy they were. Really? And how you jump to now. Mm -hmm. They will say cunt and bitch and talk more openly about their sex life with their husband. It makes me wonder what I was like 10 years ago before I wrote, before I wrote romance, before Mm -hmm. I really read deep romance, before Fifty Shades Grey came out. I don't think we were all talking this way as openly. And I think that's one thing that people Mm -hmm. have failed to understand with the romance becoming more open like this mm-hmm. is sex I feel like has become less taboo to talk about for sure yeah I would say so yeah it becoming more mainstream makes it feel more like a safer and with that conversation more people having openness with doing other things mm-hmm. I just think it's something that's missed and I feel like romance and these things coming out and women doing them is part of that yeah absolutely I, I completely agree and I think The more we normalize, having a healthy sex life is really important. You know, the more we normalize and discuss that with, you know, each other, then there's not the stigma that's attached to it and the shame of it. Like before Fifty Grades of Shea and Maya Banks and all that stuff, BDSM wasn't even like in my ever thinking. Like I didn't see it anywhere. It never, just like the first time I read a daddy book and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, like, oh, <laughs> that, made something tangle. that made something tangle. Like it was never there to register these mm. desires and wants, and that has really romance has really triggered that door. And that's why I feel like men should be more fucking thankful for it. No shit. I, I mean, I, come on, they're your their wives the are going into their husband <laughs> like, hey, can you tie me up? <laughs> you know what I mean? They yeah. should be like, motherfucking, thank you. Yep. Be like, but hell yeah. <laughs> instead of everybody looking down on it, mm-hmm. it's just annoying. But I it just made it. me think of that watching these women progress because I'm watching it. You know, it's not slowly watching over one. I'm watching all these episodes back to back and seeing yeah. the change in them all. I'm like, damn. And how much quicker it is watching it that way versus over the years mm-hmm. and seeing the subtle I get differences. I really see the change in mm-hmm. them. I'm like, wow, it's so interesting how we went from this because one girl started saying cunt and they were all appalled. Like, <laughs> say that? <laughs> no, everybody says it. Yeah. It was just interesting. I like that. Okay, this one's entitled Favorite Historical. One of my favorite historical romance books is Prisoner of My Desire by Joanna Lindsay. I think I've read Joanna Lindsay. I feel like I've read. Now I gotta. Yeah, she's old school. She's old, old school. Like Daniel Steele, old school. Um, The heroine has to marry some old rotten guy. And on the wedding night, he dies before doing the deed. So the the heroine and her maid need a guy to complete the act. So they kidnap someone who they think is a commoner, but in fact is a laird. Once he is knocked out and tied down, the heroine tries to get down the business, but he wakes up and is furious. Since she's a virgin and clueless, she just tries to sit on his dick and it isn't hard. And the maid has to give her guidance on preparing him. Mm-hmm. So she goes back in his, so she goes back in to prepare him. 
He isn't hard, but she seduces him, which only infuriates him more. And then he's hard as a rock. She does this a few more times to get pregnant before the, before his men come and find him. Yeah. The Laird is so pissed that he takes her and ties her to the wall in his bedroom. That shit is hot. And that's why I love this book, even though it's probably 30 plus years old. Love the podcast, especially on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's Loyal only like 10 years old. Martha. Do what? It's only like 10 years old. I remember oh reading God. him. It's a okay. great book. I'm gonna What's put the name it in the of the show again? notes for the you guys. Prisoner of My Desire. I'm gonna have to oh I'm setting this email off to the side so I can remember that one. <laughs> what I'm not seeing though is an audio, which I find so weird. Oh like, wow, I'm... for something that old? I would just thought for sure there would be one. Mm-mm. No, damn it. Um, yeah, so if you have um, recommendations on historical romances, I have not read many. I've only really read Kerrigan Byrne. That's it. She has I a new read, book out. I know. I saw. <laughs> it's in her, like, uh, that's like the dark uh, murder series or whatever. Mm. It's really, I read the first one. It's really good. It's not really one of her romancy ones. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, it, I had asked at one point to send in historical recommendations. So this one is historical romance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, lady podcasters. Love the podcast. I'm listening to your The Duke's Twin series and your recommendations for historical romances. Truly shocked that y'all didn't mention Beverly Jenkins novels. Beverly Jenkins. I've never read her. The creme de la creme of historical romance. Courageous heroines, alpha, honorable heroes, and hot as fuck. And I love how I learn more about the experience of blacks during the Civil War or the Revolutionary War and just everything regarding the black experience during those times. I'm not sure if you're doing any more historical romances soon, but you should really mention these. And if you haven't read them, get on it. So good. P.S. I also sent this to your Instagram account while listening to the podcast. And then I heard and then I heard your email. Sorry for the double dip, <laughs> Tori. <laughs> I love it. Like I said, I'm just not super versed in historical romances. Some mm-hmm. people, that's how they started in romance. And so I know like who these authors are, but I just haven't read. Yeah, of them. And it seems like the historicals I dipped into a lot were because authors had wrote them. Like to get on a historical kick, I had to go from like Maya Banks. Yeah, yeah. Possible. Like modern, like more modern writing authors decided to write a historical. That wasn't something that's from way back. But they're so yeah. good. I always forget how good they are until mm-hmm. I'm like forced into one. I'm like, why yeah. do I resist this? I know. That's how <laughs> I felt about Kerrigan Byrne when I read all of her books. Like I just binged them and I thought, why has no one ever explained to me how good these are? But everybody did. Everybody yeah. in my entire life has told me how good they are. I just didn't listen. Yeah. So everybody has told me how incredible Beverly Jenkins are. I'm putting that email to the side too because I'm going to read one. Uh, somebody, if you've read Beverly Jenkins, somebody tell me what's the dirtiest one to start with. Give me the, the most obsessive one to go with. All right. This was entitled Strippers. I don't know where this email came from. <laughs> I'm listening to yesterday's podcast and the subject of strippers. Oh, this is like from June. Um, the subject of strippers reminds me of an event of sorts. Back in the mid 80s, I worked at Kmart and a bunch of us went to a male strip show during an assistant manager meeting. The manager was drinking something with cherries in it. As part of the show, dancers would come to the tables and dance on them. The dancers chose our table as the last dance, and the manager gave the cherry from her drink to the stripper. After the show ended, she kept yelling loudly, Who took my cherry? <laughs> I thought you might enjoy this story. Oh, my God. I'm not going to say her name. That's funny. <laughs> I cannot oh imagine God. what a group of ladies uh, would see. No, there's no it's way. Pro- I could we were probably talking about, because I always find it so interesting. Like when I, the few times I've gone to a strip club where males were stripping, the girls are having a, a fun time. They're yeah. talking to strippers. They're laughing. They're yeah. cheering. But when you go in and women are stripping, it's like quiet. Yeah, They're right? Like it's like, staring it is serious. Yeah, yeah. it's like, I'm oh like, my God, like somebody's coming here to get fucked. Yeah. <laughs> this one's entitled Vow Renewal Slash Proposal. Hey, lady podcasters, my husband and I are planning our vow renewal right now. This is from 2019, so you've already done it. Uh, excuse Before me. Got <laughs> oh, oh, God, yeah, that's a fair point, yeah. His epic proposal happened while we were still in college. Our favorite holiday is Halloween, and we threw a huge party every year. Mm. So he had been posing. 
He had been posing me off all day because he wasn't doing anything to help me get ready for the party. Oh, he'd been pissing me off. Sorry, the auto corrected. Um, He had been pissing me off all day because he wasn't doing anything to help me get ready for the party and being super weird. He wouldn't hug me or get close to me. I know it's because he was going to puke at any moment and I was, and was terrified I was going to feel the ring box in his pocket. My mom and sister are my ride or die and I always told him I wanted them to be there when I got engaged. The fact that they invited themselves to my party should have tipped me off, but obviously, but oblivious me, he had no idea. My sister does not go out after dark on Halloween, but that's another story for another time. Halfway through the party, my husband turns down the music and gathers everyone in our living room. I'm standing there confused as fuck. He hands me a bag of candy and said, trick or treat. I reach my hand in the bag and he holds me and he, and he told me the best candy is at the bottom. I dug deep and felt the ring box. Cue jaw dropping gasp. As I lifted the box out of the bag, I distinctly remember saying to my husband, if there's not a ring in this box, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> Oh, my God. I'm super romantic, guys. <laughs> he takes a giant step back as I open the box. There was a ring, a plastic black spider ring. Divorce. Oh immediate. You're not even married. Immediate divorce. I look up, and he's down on one knee. He oh. said, that was your trick. Now, here's your treat. Oh, he pulls the ring. I know. That's actually really sweet. <laughs> he pulled the real ring out of his pocket and said some sappy stuff that I don't remember now. We were broke college kids and had been engaged for like two and a half years. I won a trip through my job and we decided to use it as a honeymoon. We planned our wedding in six weeks. Asked my mother-in-law on Christmas Eve if we could get married at her living in her living room in February. That was eight years ago. And now we're planning a vow renewal at Disney World in October 2021. I wonder if it happened. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, it just says, thanks, Valerie. Valerie, if you are listening, we have to know. (laughs) I want the follow-up to that now. All right. Let's do one more. Hold on. Oh, this one's recent. Let's do this one. Follow up from Collard Greens, Gross Things, and PTA Hell Stories. Hello, Lady DJs. I'm not quite caught up with this week's podcast yet, but hopefully to find some time this weekend to listen. I wanted to follow up with you about your ask for Valentine's Day stories and to spill some tea about my PTA Hell experience. Valentine's Day has for me... Valentine's Day for me has been a bust almost every year ever since middle school really. My shoebox for Valentine's was always pretty bare at the end of the school day. The one year I had an actually legit date on February 14th was 1986 and I was so excited because my date was going to introduce me to Cunnilingus. (laughs) I was a high school senior and my date was a real hottie guy. Truth. However, there was an epic ice storm and everything shut down for a week. I kind of gave up any sort of expectation after that, which is fine. It's very fake holiday. I like it, it like New Year's Eve can be. My husband of 31 years is a sweetie and often surprises me in the best ways. The most romantic, sentimental thing he has ever done, hands down, was to gift me an emerald and diamond ring for my 35th birthday when our daughter was only six months old. It's a small band, very petite me. It's, a, it's in perfect style. Husband told me, I know it's not your birthstone. I chose the emerald because it's our daughter's birthstone. Cue lots of sobbings and happy tears. PTA hell. Here's a great story for you. I served as secretary for a year and board of president for one year at my elementary school. Nobody wanted to do it and they were all thrilled. I agreed. Then proceeded to back to then proceeded to backbite, lie, hold meetings without me and the like. Everyone says they want change, but they fucking hate it when everything is new, right? After two disastrous years, we exited the public school system for a private school. Not because of the PTA, but that was a fucking blessing (laughs) to let that shit show go. It was a tough transition going from a public school mom set to the pearls and cashmere doctor's wives, but set, but we made it work. Anyway, during our second year in our new private school, I attended a school function to be supportive of our new school and to be the new parent. Um, who had put it on. Having seen the newbie myself only the year before, I knew what that felt like. It was a great event, successful, fun, all that jazz. When I spoke to the organizer afterwards to offer my thanks and how she was settling in, that parent proceeded to tell me how horrible the previous year 
at their old public school had been, especially since the previous PTA president had left everything in such shambles <laughs> and how she had to fix so many problems caused by the previous president. On and on and on. Ladies, that previous president was me. Moi. Myself. <laughs> Love this email. I let her talk for a while before I made her aware of whom she was speaking with, that I was the previous PTA president. The look of horror on her fucking face, LOL. It was a moment such as one finds in a Hollywood movie, and it was glorious. I still, to this day, make sure to say hello to her when I bump into her at Harris Teeter. All super sugary sweet, all the way as Southern ladies do. Karma, bitch. Karma. Mel and Leah, y'all rock and roll. Cheers. Teresa and Salisbury. I love, I love that. <laughs> She's got more balls than me. I would have just been like, God. I know. I would have kept that bad. quiet. I'd have been like, oh, that's really nice to meet you. Okay, bye. <laughs> like, totally would have done or it. Or I'd have been really defensive. I'm like, well, maybe it was a lot of work. Maybe this Maybe she that. had a lot going on. Maybe there was a lot of things happening in her life. <laughs> have some compassion. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. So we've got the second installment of Girls Night Out by Ember Davis. Um, like I said on Tuesday's episode, she has a couple of books that are coming out. She's got Ask Me to Stay. It's the In Praise of Older Women series. Um, on April 15th, she's got After the Rain, a Man of the Month Club novella. That one is a sister's best friend small town romance. And then on April 19th, she's got Bedazzling the Jeweler, a pink temp agency series. So she's got some awesome books coming out. Oh, and if you love this story that you're listening to right now, if you love listening to Amelia and Beckett, this is part of, this is just like an introductory to the two of them. Um, they have a whole book, Protecting His Home. So you can get that now and go listen to it. So, or um, go read that now. And then you're going to listen to the second half of um, Girls Night Out now. So. Yeah, there's a whole series for this. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So this is a great way to like test it out. And like we said earlier, if you're loving this, you're going to love everything she she writes. So, yeah. And all of her books are in Kindle Unlimited. Oh, I love that. Okay, cool. So, yep, there right. you go. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. Chapter 3. Amelia. I may have dragged my feet on going out, but I was having a lot of fun. It was nice not to worry about the kids, or my job, or even Beckett for a little while. I could simply be me, with my girls as my only concern, while being confident they can take care of themselves. The ride over in the bus was a blast. After, of course, they got it out of their systems about how I probably made Beckett swallow his tongue, and the dazed look on my face as I got onto the bus. What can I say? The man affects me. Strongly. It didn't take long to be surrounded by laughter and a buzz of excitement. The feeling stayed with us as we passed Tex at the door, where he earned a hug from me, and into Aces. It was a little busier than I was hoping it would be tonight. Probably because the weather has finally broken, and you don't feel the cold grip of winter the same way. Spring is here and people are out ready to mingle. I don't really like people, at least not a club full of them, but it was far too late to go back on the night. After we finished our first drink, I could feel the shift in the atmosphere of the club. I swear it's a barometric thing associated with being close to the caveman who owns your whole existence. I can still feel it, the way Beckett touched my wrist the first day we met, when he was being a monumental ass. The same thing still happens. The zing. Is it possible that one day it won't happen anymore? I hate the thoughts of a negative future, of a reality where Beckett isn't in my life. But I'm so far gone for this man now, I don't know who I'd be if it ever happened. Would I lose this family in the process, too? Everything my life is built upon? What would I find in the rubble? Andrea, of course, because she likes to stir up trouble, lets the air settle around us for a moment before dragging me onto the dance floor. I don't know if my protests go unnoticed or if she doesn't care. 
Probably both. I should know better than to try and be polite with some guy coming up on me at the club. Especially with my husband watching me. Damn those manners. Politeness didn't last long. The moment he pushed it, I glared at him and was trying to get him to back off. Then he touched me. My inner slut was screaming about how happy she was, because it would flip Beckett's switch and force him out of hiding. Another part of me, the rational and nurturing part, felt bad, because the guy trying to hit on me might not walk away without a black eye or a bloody nose. Now, I find myself over my husband's shoulder. Before I met the guys in this family, I wasn't aware that my curvy self could be thrown over someone's shoulder without some real damage being done. I've now learned my lesson, and then some. I'm looking at my husband's tight ass as he stalks through the club and right out the front door. Tex laughs, and I think he says something about Lincoln, the head of security for the club but I don't catch it all because too much blood is rushing to my head. Beckett doesn't stop until he gets to his car, and then I'm right it again. The move is so fast I wobble, even in my flats, but he's there to steady me. His green eyes aren't on mine, though. Instead, his laser-like gaze is on my cleavage. When I look down, I see why. Strapless bras are not designed to go upside down and my breasts are almost completely exposed. I reach to adjust myself, but Beckett captures my wrists before pulling them up over my head, leaning me around the side of his car. He transfers both wrists to one of his large, capable hands, pressing them down against the roof of his car. Beckett, I gasp. I look around, worried we have a gaggle of people watching us. He runs his nose up my neck, my pulse pounding as he takes a deep breath. He growls against my skin. If you think for one second I would lay you out like this with your perfect tits spilling from your dress for any other man to see, then you haven't been paying attention, baby. There's a threat in his words, in his voice, in every muscle of his body one I want to become acquainted with. Like from the tips of my curled toes to the end of every strand of my hair acquainted. This was supposed to be a girl's night out. You can't crash it and then haul me out of there like I'm a giant sack of flour. I try and sound indignant, angry, put out, annoyed. I sound turned the fuck on. Damn it. The chuckle which leaves him claws at my skin, leaving scratches with ragged edges in its wake. He nips and kisses down my chest before his tongue skims along the edge of my obscene cleavage. He tisks me before burying his face in the valley of my breasts, letting out a sound between a groan and a purr. You knew I wasn't going to simply let you out tonight not looking like sin and sex on two legs. His voice should not almost make me come, and after all this time I shouldn't be surprised by it. I sass him. Those are gams to you. Amelia, he grits out through his teeth. I fucking love it when he says my name like that. That asshole was too fucking close to you. I bite my lip and look away from him. He's right. He touched you. Your skin. I know, love, I whisper. Beckett's free hand plunges into my hair, gripping at the nape of my neck and tugging to tip my head up. His lips slam down on mine, prying my lips open as he takes me, owning me. My body comes alive under him. It always does. I could take you right here. I know, I whimper. Before I really know what's going on, he pulls me away from the car and opens the door, telling me to get in with his jaw tight. 
His whole body feels like it's barely controlled, barely on this side of humanity. I can feel his primal beast, which exists and thrives on instinct, close to being let loose. Taking the time to buckle me in, while knowing I'm fully capable myself, makes me fall in love with my husband a little bit more. I fiddle with my ring while we head out of the city. The tension between us, built on lust and desire, folded in with the need and electricity which is always there, always breathing between us, grows every moment we're in the car. When I can't take it anymore, I blurt, Where are we going? What about the kids? Beckett slides his gaze over to me. We're going to the cabin for a few days, and the kids will be fine. I left them enough goldfish to last them in some bowls throughout the house. I gasp and swat his arm, both of us bursting into laughter together. I shake my head. You would never. Reaching over, he laces our fingers together and rests our hands on my thigh. You're right. I wouldn't. Even if it is tempting. He glances over and winks. They're taken care of. The tension between us is mildly settled, but is still simmering the entire drive to the cabin outside Denver, which Margot got Blake for Christmas a few years ago. I had never known someone to gift real estate as a present, but I've learned to get used to being around more cash than any normal person could fathom. We chat, but I notice he steers the conversation away from work and the kids. For some reason, it makes the tension leech from my body, like I can ignore those responsibilities, if only for a little while. It's a nice reminder of what is the center, the nexus, the most important thing, him and the love we have between us. When we arrive, I think I float to the front door. When it's opened and I'm pulled in, Beckett pushes me against the door, cupping my ass and lifting me. My legs wrap around his hips, letting me feel his hard cock pressing against me. I'm instantly reminded I'm not wearing panties. The friction between us makes me moan. I can't arch my body against his because of the way he's pressing me against the door, leaving no space between us. This reminds me of the first time I got you in our house, baby, he moans, and kisses down my neck. I gasp. Are you going to fuck me against it? We didn't do that the first time, but I need you. Beckett pulls me away from the door, causing me to grab onto his shoulders as he carries me deeper into the mansion and the mountains that we're in right now. All alone. For an unknown amount of time. The low rumble of his voice makes my clit throb. I want you on a bed, Amelia so I can enjoy every inch of you properly. I moan his name, the voices of worry and fear inside me quieting in the light of the way he wants me. His green eyes glitter as he removes the few articles of clothing I have on before stripping himself. Talk about a show you want the front row to. I catch a glimpse of the tattoo on his ribs, the one of me the pinup he drew the morning before he met me. The romantic in me always wanted to believe in fate, in something beyond what I could see, something which exists in the ephemera of feeling. I never had proof of it, but then I met Beckett. The feral glint in my husband's eye makes me scoot up toward the headboard slightly before he lets out a low growl of warning, which has me freezing. He crawls toward me slowly, leaving kisses on the inside of each of my knees. His lips trail up the inside of my thighs. Slowly. Far too slowly. I'm going to make you come so many times while we're here, Amelia. You aren't going to be able to remember what has been bugging you lately. There's a promise in his eyes as he settles between my legs, his hands holding me open for him to gaze upon, to feast upon, 
if the way he licks his lips is any indication of his intentions. Nothing's been bugging me. I barely get the words out, as he snakes his tongue between the wet lips of my pussy, causing me to arch my back. His eyes stare up my body, holding me hostage as he sucks my clit into his mouth. My hands fly down to his head, so my fingers can dig into his hair. It's so soft. I love running my fingers through it. He laps at me. He nips at me. He teases me, pushing me right to the edge, but not letting me fall over. I know what he's doing. He's trying to get me to beg, to admit, to lay myself and all that I am at his feet. Please, love. I keen the words, my back arching, my hips begging. He nips at my clit, and it's almost enough. Almost, but not quite. I'm groaning and pleading as he crawls up my body before kissing me hard, letting me taste myself on his lips. I give myself over to him, letting myself fall into him, into us. I know he'll catch me. Chapter 4 Beckett The way my wife's body welcomes me, pulling me closer, singeing my skin with the electricity between us, makes me forget we have any responsibilities beyond right here and now. Kissing her is home. With her is the only place I want to be. Always. I grip her hip, propping myself up on my other arm next to her head as I take a deep breath, trying to control myself. When I bury my face in her neck, her scent surrounding me, I can't hold back. Not with the way her nails dig into my skin. Not with the way I can feel how wet she is against my hard shaft. I barely stop myself from slamming home. But I need more from her. I need it all. Want it. While we're here for a few days, we're going to spend it all naked. You aren't allowed to wear clothes. Not a single stitch. There's a command in my voice, one which makes my wife's eyes dilate. Her breath hitches before she moans the words. Please, Beckett. I grin at her, a feral thing which grows on my face and makes her eyes widen. I don't let her take a breath. I don't let her heart beat. The head of my cock finds her entrance, and I fuck into her fast and hard. The walls of her pussy stretch before clamping down around my length, the feeling making me moan. Fuck, I bark out. It always feels so damn good filling you up, baby. Amelia's nails dig into my shoulders as her breathing deepens, her eyes pleading with me. I hold still, deep inside her channel, letting her stretch for me, letting her feel every inch. I kiss her softly before I start moving, needing the sweet with the rough, the kind with the hard. She widens her legs, her knees coming up and squeezing my hips as her heels dig into my ass. She might as well have spurs on, because the need she has, the way she presses her body into mine and meets my every thrust, makes me want to wreck her. I want her sobbing because she's experiencing so much pleasure. I want her forgetting her own fucking name, the only thing she knows being my cock and the way I make her feel. Your sweet pussy is squeezing my cock just right, baby. I barely get it out through my clenched teeth. It's the only thing stopping me from filling her up with my cum right now. Even as my balls draw up. Even as a tingling starts in my spine. Are you going to talk? Or are you going to fuck me? 
she taunts me with mischief in her eyes. I smirk down at her as I start to move harder, faster, taking perverse pleasure in the way her eyes roll back in her head. As much as I love seeing her brown eyes looking at me, seeing her on the edge of bliss is better. So much better. I'm going to do both, I growl. My teeth nip at her ear before my lips travel down her chest to suck one of her nipples into my mouth. When I bite down on it, she makes a mewling sound. I want to hear it again. I let go with a pop, satisfaction filling me at how wet her nipple is, at how it puckers, hardens, because of my attention. It speaks to the primal part of me which wants to give my woman, my only woman, so much pleasure. You love my dirty fucking mouth, baby. Yes, she groans out. Please, I need you. You've got me, Amelia. Her eyes snap to mine. She focuses through the fog, through the lust. A moment of clarity. She knows I'm not talking about right now. She knows I'm not talking about her pleasure, either. My heart, my soul, my body. Every piece of me is yours. I gave it to you years ago, and you've taken such good care of it. My lips trail across her chest, and I whisper against her other nipple, the one begging for attention. Such good care. Such a good girl. My hips punch forward, filling her with my cock, before pulling back, pulling against her wet heat, which doesn't want to let me go. I feel the drag, the pull, the way her pussy begs me to fill her again, to push inside, stretch her, and never stop. I give her body exactly what it wants as I move above her, surrounding her. A thin sheen of sweat covers my back as my tongue plays with the diamond peak of her nipple. When she plunges her fingers into my hair, she holds me to her, her back arching and feeding me more of her flesh. I try and hold off, but I can feel us marching toward our peak, toward the infinity which exists between us, the one we can only touch and experience when we're like this, primal, natural. She starts mumbling, but it's hard to catch the words over the thudding of my own heart in my chest. I can't hear them, but I can feel her words as she pleads for more, begs to come, yearns to be set free. I'll always give it to her. Always. I release her nipple before burying my face in the crook of her neck, our bodies aligned and my hips moving faster, harder. She makes a pleading sound as I feel us teetering right on the edge, the countdown almost at its inevitable end. So close. Right fucking there. You're going to come all over my cock, Amelia, I growl out. Now, I command, and then bite down on her shoulder. It does what it always does. Her body made to be loved by me, to be given pleasure no one else could ever match. She goes off, her body tightening and releasing in one powerful explosion we are barely able to hold on to each other through. The tingling starts at the base of my spine and spreads through my body as I push into her heat fully and paint her walls with ropes of my cum. It feels like it goes on forever as we cling to each other, as our bodies come back online, pulled back from the brink of extinction which always feels like it's so close when we indulge in our desire together. Our breathing slows down, our hearts following, sinking up, falling in line. When I look into Amelia's dark brown eyes, her pupils blown, and the worries she's been carrying around with her gone, I fall in love with my wife all over again. I love you, baby.
I rasp against her lips, kissing her softly, reminding her how right here is the only place which matters. I love you, Beck, she sighs. I grin at her and roll us so we're on our sides facing each other. She snuggles into my chest, her fingers running lazily over my skin, the air around us cooling as our bodies and our need do as well. When she basks in the afterglow, nothing can touch her. Just the way I like it. What's been going on in that beautiful head of yours lately, Amelia? Her eyes are slow to come up to mine, and I see a flash of doubt, of fear, right there. It guts me. She shrugs one shoulder, as her beautiful, plump lips thin into a grimace. I can see her weighing her words, thinking them through. Sometimes she can be so spontaneous, her words spilling from her without thought. Then other times she measures each one, testing it in her mind. I don't know, Beckett. I give her a look, one which is both hard and expectant. With a shake of her head, she spills. Really, I don't. I guess lately I've been thinking about the possibilities of this life, of our lives, and how devastated I would be if... She trails off, her words caught in her throat, and tears brimming in her gorgeous eyes. Amelia? There's a warning and a command in my tone. There is no if for us. There is nothing except us. I run my fingers through her curls, trying to calm her and kill whatever voice in her head has her questioning me, questioning us. I'm sorry if I've given you any reason to doubt me or what we have. One tear escapes. It's quick, but I see it. I always see when it comes to her. Her voice is small. You haven't given me a reason to doubt anything. You're perfect, she admits on a sigh. The laugh which comes out of her is hollow, tortured. I don't even know how to put it into words. Maybe life has been too good, you know? I chuckle, which only makes her narrow her eyes at me. Abort. Abort. I can't help it. She's too damn cute. I don't think you should court trouble or look for something which isn't there, Amelia. It's okay to have a good life. It doesn't mean bad stuff is on the horizon. It simply means you are loved and supported. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to embrace it. It's okay, baby. You deserve it. She clings to me and buries her face in my chest. Her words are muffled, but I still hear her. Don't you ever leave me, Beckett Banks. She pulls back. Those brown eyes I love so much, still swimming with tears. I wouldn't survive it. You're the center. You keep me grounded. And I love you so fucking much. I press our foreheads together. Our faces too close, and yet somehow not close enough. I'll never leave you, Amelia. Not in this life or any other. I'll always find you, I promise. My vows aren't just about this lifetime. They're for forever. Forever, ever? She teases me, a genuine smile on her face, and I internally breathe a sigh of relief. I make a silent promise to her, to us, to do this for her more often, to get her away from the rest of the world the rest of the family. They all love her, though not as much as I do, and she would run herself into the ground for any one of them. I need to do a better job of looking out for her, for making sure her batteries are recharged, that her soul can fly free. She deserves it, and so much more. She deserves a star shining brightly in the night sky. She deserves the rainbow after a storm. She deserves the lightning strike and the rain. 
She deserves it all. I shake my head, flashing her a grin before I kiss her forehead. Her fingertips are idle on the tattoo of her on my ribs. I can't believe I drew her that morning, having never seen her before. It was a sign. I thanked the universe I was smart enough, good enough, worthy enough to heed it. My life would be nothing without her. So, if we're going to be naked the whole time we're here, did you even bring a bag? She grimaces slightly. I can't wear that dress home whenever we leave here. I laugh and kiss her hard, stealing her breath. My cock responds to the softness of her lips. It always does. I rasp against her mouth. I packed a bag, baby. Don't worry. She pulls back to look up at me from underneath her lashes, biting her lip. Did you pack any yarn? This time when I laugh, it's loud and fills the whole room. She joins me, the sound of our joy combining into something so beautiful. It makes my heart flip in my chest. She knows it turns me on to watch her crochet. If that's not love and passion, I don't know what is. I nod, and her eyes sparkle. Like I would forget something as important as her yarn. She winks at me, and I know she never really doubted me. I pull away from her enough to grab her hips and flip her onto her stomach my cock aching to get back inside her. When I smack her ass, the moan which comes out of her has me leaking pre-cum already. Hands and knees, Amelia, I grunt. I'll go get the bags after I fill you again with my cum. She looks at me over her shoulder. I stopped my birth control last week. Fuck, I growl and pull her up, sliding into her without warning. She knows what it does to me when she's unprotected. I might not get her pregnant tonight, but it doesn't matter. It will happen when it's supposed to, just like when she came into my life. Epilogue One year and eight-ish months later. Amelia Damn it. I was not supposed to tell Beckett I'm pregnant yet. It's Christmas Eve, and I have a whole thing planned out for tomorrow which involves him opening presents in a specific order. One from Ridge, one from Kaya, and one from me. They were like a little scavenger hunt toward Babyville. But I just ruined it. It just slipped out. I blame putting together this impromptu Christmas party in the hospital waiting room where Levi and Rowan are welcoming their first child. When I found out Rowan went into labor, I thought it would be nice to bring them a little Christmas cheer, but I let my walls down a little too much. I can't help it. I'm extra emotional when I'm pregnant. Beckett keeps looking over at me, and I see the caveman he is underneath peeking out. The beast, which is so damn proud of knocking up his mate. I swear he's about two seconds away from beating his chest and talking about his super sperm. And no, it's not worth mentioning it's taken us more than a year and a half to get pregnant. He would simply say his super sperm were waiting until the right time. Because clearly, his sperm are sentient. Fucking hell. I love my man. He's ridiculous, but in a way which makes me feel warm and cared for. Loved more than I could even begin to quantify. As much as I've longed for another little baby in my arms, I'm glad I've had this time with Etheridge and Kaya. I think they'll be excited now to have another baby in the house. They love playing with all the kids in the family. We've created a nice little village to help with the kids, to help with each other, to support, to love, to nurture, to care. I'm a lucky woman. I ignore the predatory look in my husband's eyes. Until it's time for us to head home. But we make sure to leave plenty of food behind. No one wants to be in the hospital for Christmas. Even if it's because of new life coming into the world. 
I hope the nurses share the cookies with everyone. I wouldn't blame them if they don't, either. The whole way home, I can feel the tension in Beckett, the want to jump me, but I ignore it. It's easier to do with the kids chattering away. They're full of excitement while speculating about the gifts they'll open tomorrow. I have a feeling the only gift Beckett is interested in unwrapping is me. He rushes me into the house and then helps me put the kids to bed in a very efficient manner. He's not simply going through the motions, but he certainly is moving at a brisker pace. When I'm leaving Kaya's room, my husband is leaning against the hallway wall, his green eyes finding mine before I can close the door behind me. There's so much heat in his gaze that it causes my breath to hitch. As I move to walk past him, I whisper, Do you want to pick a movie to put on while we finish wrapping the last of the presents? I don't get an answer. Not in words. Instead, he grips my hips and pulls me against his body, the hard planes of him a perfect counterpoint to my soft curves. They always have been. He turns us and presses me against the wall, kissing me long and hard, deepening it when I moan. He explores me, tastes me, sends my body on an adventure, and then brings me back home as he slows the kiss down. I can taste the love he has for me, the happiness he's feeling, the gratefulness. As one of his large hands comes down against my belly, he whispers against my lips, Are you really pregnant, Amelia? We're going to have another baby? I look up at him and see the unshed tears in his green eyes. He always gets emotional when it's about our babies, and I love him for it, amongst a million other things. He's an amazing father and an even better partner. Yeah, I croak out, my throat clogged with emotion. We're going to have another baby. He kisses my forehead before he presses his own against mine. Thank you. When I wrap my arms around his torso, I would pull him closer, but there is already no space between us. No, Beckett. You don't have to thank me ever. We built this life together. You never let me wallow in the hard times, even when I had no idea why they were hard to begin with. You never let me face my demons alone. You fight by my side and make me strong with your love. I feel a tear streak down my cheek, but he's right there, kissing it away, taking in my emotion and making it his own. He makes a noise of contentment in the back of his throat as we stand in the hallway clinging to each other. I look down the hallway and see my print of Dali's The Hallucinogenic Toreador hanging where his once was. Mine was bigger, so we switched it, and his is in my office. I remember the first time I saw it in his house. Our house. I laid all my secrets, all my pain, at his feet. And he still looked at me like I was a beautiful gift he was more than happy to receive. He still looks at me the same way. Every single day. Amelia he rasps. I look back up into his eyes, where my life's greatest adventure still stretches in front of me. Since you gave me a gift early, I want to do the same. I furrow my eyebrows. You don't have to do that, Beck. I can wait. He shakes his head. You'll still open it tomorrow, but I'm going to tell you now, especially because I'm sure you've been a little worried about the space in our home. I bite my lip and nod. I wondered how we were all going to fit, considering the bedrooms are occupied with Ridge and Kaya. With another on the way, I did have... concerns. Once the ground thaws, we break ground on our house out on the commune land. The construction company Troy's uncle owns will do the shell of the house, and then J&J &J Construction will do the interior, 
with Autumn designing it with you. We've joked for years about Cole Howard, the lead singer for Suburban Outcasts, buying a huge property outside of Denver, where he and the rest of the band have built homes, calling it a commune. Now, the prospect of moving out there, of building the perfect home for us, surrounded by people we love and who love us back, it's perfect. I don't have words. The look in Beckett's eyes tell me I don't need them. So with tears streaming down my face, and so much fucking happiness in my heart, I kiss my husband, making us breathless. The past and the future don't matter, because only this moment does. Just like every moment with him. This has been Girls' Night Out by Ember Davis. Read for you by Matthew Maddox. Welcome back. Hey. Thank you so much, Ember, for being with us here this week. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you for bringing us Girls' Night Out. And like I said earlier, if you love it, go check out everything she has. Um, up next week, we have Claire Hastings with the book Assist. It's brand new. It's my first Claire Hastings book. I'm super excited to listen to it. She's been so sweet. It's going to be from her Atlanta Rising Football Series. So if you guys yeah. like that jump start, mm -hmm. you can jump into that series now. The cover's hot too. So, yeah. yeah. And all, all right. of her books are sold on all platforms. Oh, nice. That's cool. So, okay, good. There you go. All, all right. right. Well, that's it. Don't forget to check out. Oh, the new release post. Check out the new releases and check out our books. Um, Avalanche. Yes. And Avalanche of Love is most likely out today or tomorrow. So, Just wait and right. see. <laughs> Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance, read, read me romance, read me romance.